Thanks for hanging out with me early on Friday night. Hopefully you got some drinks for happy hour. All right, so yeah, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with me, uh, I am Jimmy.eth, Jimmy with a one. Uh, I got into NFTs actually in December of 2017. Uh, December of 2017. Uh, and before that, uh, the way I discovered blockchain was I was walking on the Appalachian Trail in early 2017, and uh, I was trying to walk the entire 2,200 miles. I started in Georgia. I ended up in Virginia, and that's where I got off the trail. It was about 750 miles. Uh, it took me about two months to get there. And uh, about a week before I decided I was done, uh, I was walking next to a guy who told me that he was making money every day walking down the trail doing the same thing I was doing. And I asked him, how are you doing that? And he said uh, he was mining Bitcoin. And I was like, that's cool. And he mentioned, I started talking about it a little bit more, and I'd been familiar with uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, Bitcoin and everything all the way back to like 2011 or whenever the hell it launched. Um, but I remember it being, I thought it was a scam. And I remember Mt. Gox got hacked and you know the price dropped. And the last time I had checked, the price was around $400. And this guy on the Appalachian Trail in 2017 told me he was mining Bitcoin at like $4,000 per coin. And uh, I was like, holy shit, this is like the thing I was looking for. And so I got off the trail about uh, a week later, as I said, and then uh, went home and built some mining rigs and started mining Ethereum. And then r right around like October, November, December is when things really took off um, in, in 2017. Uh, all the cryptocurrencies were going wild, all time highs, all these ICOs were launching. So I was just, you know, in that market, you know, speculating, buying ICOs, then doing my research and then dumping it really quick before anybody else realized how crappy it was. Uh, and uh, I realized that wasn't really like why I got into the space um, and started to get bored on that pretty quickly. It just so happened CryptoKitties launched like right around that time. And I minted my first CryptoKitty, I think on December 4th, 2017. It was a really bad cat. I paid too much for it. I had a couple of failed transactions before it went through. I didn't even have much ether, so every failed transaction I had to like mine more Ethereum before I could try again. Um, but I, I really liked that because the guy on the trail was talking about, you know, he had machines working for him while he was walking on the trail. And I thought that was a really cool concept, machines working for you. And, uh, uh, and so when I saw NFTs and these, the first NFTs I saw, punks had been out for about six months, but I, had, I hadn't come across those yet. But CryptoKitties allowed you to take two cats and breed them together and create a new CryptoKitty. And you paid a miner, you paid a fee that was basically compensating the miners for doing the transaction on the chain. It was 0 0.008 ETH to, to mint one. And uh, that, uh, that was cool too because I thought, well, you can breed the cats and create some new value potentially out of it that could be worth more than 0 0.008. So essentially these NFTs, in this case CryptoKitties, could work for you too. So I decided that, you know, since the ICO stuff seemed like, you know, it wasn't going to play out so well and the crypto markets themselves started to dive at, in mid-December to late December, um, I thought that like NFTs could be where maybe I could find my time and energy and focus. I wasn't really approaching the space with any specific direction. I was just thought that there was something really cool here and I needed to figure out where I fit. So uh, I lost my ass trying to breed cats for a little while because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I saw all these people like creating these things called fancy cats. They were like a special uh, addition that you could create if you came up with the right combination of traits. Um, and if you could make a fancy cat, if you could make a fancy cat, if you could make a fancy cat, then you could usually sell that for more than the breeding costs and sometimes a lot more. Um, so eventually, uh, a guy that I became a good friend of mine later, I didn't know at the time and wouldn't meet until about nine months later, a guy named Kai Turner, he came up with something called the Kai code. It's K-A-I. And that was the code that decoded the genetics on the CryptoKitties. And uh, the CryptoKitties have like this genetic string stored on chain. They don't have any of the art or any of the metadata, but they have this genetic string that could interpret to all that stuff. Kai figured out how to decode that. And so now, you could go and look and figure out what genetics your cats had in the hidden genes, because there's hidden genetics as well, and you could uh, figure out the probabilities of breeding these different combinations of traits and getting the outcome you want. So then it became like an odds game where you might have a one in six chance with these two cats to make a fancy. So I would, uh, you could then determine like if it's worth it for you to do it or not, or just take a chance. So anyways, I did that for a long time. 
Uh, all of 2018, I bred CryptoKitties. Uh, I, was a moder I became a moderator in the CryptoKitties Discord after I found that. That's where I found all of my really like good friends in the space that I'm still friends with today. There's about 15 of us that kind of stuck together through that whole 2018 and 2019 period, which was a really bad crypto winter. Um, there was really... Just I mean, we were, we were buying ETH for like 200 bucks, you know, and... Uh, I have to interrupt Jim here for a second. This is when Jim called me and he was like, I found cats on the internet, you should get some. And he's like, okay, dude, cool. Like, and then really? I call him like six months later and be like, dude, now there's like punks or like, you know, some other project on it. And you're like, yeah, cool, man, that's, that's neat. Needless to say, I did not breed any cats and that's why Jim is Jim and I'm here. But um, this is a really cool time, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, so going through that period, um, I, I managed to breed not all of the crypto kitties. There's definitely people who made a lot more than me, but I did manage, manage to breed about 3,000 crypto kitties, 3,500 crypto kitties, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of cash turned into Ethereum, because eventually the mining couldn't keep up with my crypto kitties addiction. Um, and uh, that's all sunken costs because the crypto kitties aren't really uh, worth that much today, at the moment at least. Um, but it was what got me into the space. It, it helped me learn. It made me dive in because I love the project and I wanted to learn everything I could about NFTs and CryptoKitties. And along the way, what I learned was these things I was spending tens of thousands of dollars on, uh, the images and the information about them, which is what I consider the real value, not the token itself. The token is like a vessel. Uh, none of that information was stored on chain. So I did a thought exercise in 50 years. I willed these things to my kids. What happens? Well, they're going to laugh at me because they're just going to get some empty tokens that have some string on it that are worth nothing. And like, why did my dad even bother putting this in the will? So I had started having debates with people about the um, idea of sticking things on chain. And little did I know that there was a project uh, that came out just before CryptoKitties called CryptoCats. CryptoCats? I think that's what it's called. Yeah, let's just go with that. So CryptoCats, which actually did store the cat information on chain and everything else, was a really cool mechanism. I didn't had no idea about that at the time. Um, so I was trying to debate the merits of that. Well, 2019, uh, the same folks who made CryptoPunks made something called Autoglyphs. Um, there was only 512 of them. They were uh, generative art. Uh, it's just ASCII art, actually, limited ASCII art, on chain and makes these patterns. But it was on chain. They stored it on chain. It was generated on chain. And when I saw that, in like, it was like April or May of 2019, uh, I said, okay, uh, so Larva Labs, who is, owns CryptoPunks, was considered one of the most reputable uh, companies in the space and thought leaders. They feel like on-chain has something to it, so maybe like, I should dive into this. This is a good idea. Uh, and uh, right from there, uh, I started conceptualizing Avastars. There's an Avastar right there. Uh, and at first I wasn't going to do any like detailed art or anything like that. I really love that one. Um, I wasn't going to do any detailed art or anything. I was just going to do like smiley faces and like stick them on the chain just to prove a point. That's all I was trying to do is prove that like it's viable to do. We found a pretty efficient way to do on chain. It's viable to do and uh, it's better. And so. I had people like Kai, though, that I had gotten to know by now that told me I had to like, take the art seriously and do a real project. So ended up spending the better part of a year uh, developing crypto, or sorry, developing Avastars. Uh, and we launched it in February 2020. Um, and then we, that was the founder sale. And then we did the public sale starting on 4-20-2020. Um, so the project's a little bit over two years old now. Um, from that, that led to me uh, setting up my company, NFT42, uh, which then we started trying to figure out ways to allow other people to put their NFTs on chain and we created the platform Nameless from that. Um, so, and then in 2020, last year in, I don't know, was it May 2020? No, 21. May 2021, uh, the other thing I'm pretty well known for at this point is I minted 420 uh, Bored Apes on like the night they sold out. Uh, this is... This is another one of those times where Jim called me at one in the morning and said, I just spent $100,000 on monkey pictures. <laughs> to be fair, I did give you one or two or three. Yeah, totally. I, I, had, I had 420 and I loved the project and I felt like it was a great entry point for a lot of people who had not yet been red-pilled. 
So I started giving them out to friends and family um, and coworkers. I think I offered one to everybody in the company that responded. And uh, I, I don't know exactly how many I gave out. The blockchain holds that record. I'm estimating somewhere around 60 to 80 I probably gave away. We joke, but Jim has had this intuition for a really long time. And it's, it's actually a nice segue into my next question. I didn't mix this note card up. Y you've had the foresight on the industry for a long time. What do you see on the next horizon? Well, I'm definitely not, uh, I don't, I can't predict the future. I can only like trust my instincts and my guts. Uh, what's next? Well, uh, right now uh, with the market taking a downturn, which you guys talked about a little bit in the last session, um, it's a little harder, well, it's not harder to predict, um, but we're gonna definitely see new ideas emerge, I think, for the last year since Board Apes minted. It's been predominantly uh, adjective animal projects and uh, it's been a lot, little bit of a frenzy. I don't think a lot of the people who have come to the space have had time to learn about the technology and what matters and what doesn't and uh, where they should be assigning value to these things and where they shouldn't. Um, so hopefully this is an opportunity for uh, the entire space to take a collective breather and learn a little bit. Um, as to what's next, as to what's next, I mean, I think Gary started something last year with the access uh, utility uh, to uh, v VCon, which I just went to VCon a few weeks ago, if any of you guys were there. It was a great conference, a lot of like positive vibes, definitely wag me attitude and stuff. Um, but it was fun and it was uplifting. Uh, I think that that membership model and membership access and uh, giving you more than just the uh, it, NFT itself and like leaning more into that community aspect uh, I think that's probably a, a, a pretty good value that um, a lot of projects in the Web3 space will see. And it's also a decent way for Web2 companies and enterprise and um, brands to enter the space as well as by offering real world, real, real world benefits to the NFTs um, that you hold. So probably like membership and access are probably going to be like the, the meta for part of this year. Hopefully we don't have to do more adjective animals, but it could potentially be that too. We had goblins a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> goblins, everybody. So that's a good point though. The, the introduction of utility, especially with the way that Gary blew that out last year. Um, so th there's an interesting sort of uh, change here. So a lot of people in the room are artists and creators. Uh, other people in the room are builders, or they're building products and things like that. With that, let's call it prediction, I'm gonna go out there a little bit, of utility being what comes in the horizon, what do you see some of the problems that people should be thinking about and solving for, right? Because it's, it's one thing to create a community, and we've seen a lot of that, but now that, again, considering the macro environment, what do you think builders and creators should be thinking about as, as it pertains to the problems that exist out there today? I think like the number one issue for any project um, brand, anybody creating an NFT these days is uh, if you're not directly targeting existing NFT communities and members, then you have to onboard new users. And onboarding new users is definitely a challenge. It's something that we all have to work on together. Um, a lot of my onboarding that I've done has been individually, one by one by one by one. It's the same way I built like my Avastars community and everything else, one person by one person. I'm building this project. Come on, hang out. I probably did that for six months before I had 500 people in my server initially. I mean, this was a different time for NFTs. Um, you couldn't just tweet and have 10,000 people join your server. Um, but, <laughs> but. I think that that's like the main challenge is like how do we get you know the next 10, 20, 30 million people into NFTs and billion people after that. And the reality is is that we're not going to get a billion people to write down their seed phrase. We're not going to get a billion people to store their seed phrase in their safe that they don't have, right? Um, so we have to come up with. I, I, I honestly think that I was really excited when uh, Coinbase got into NFTs earlier this year. I was really hopeful that they would come out and allow for people to purchase NFTs in their custodial wallet solution because um, that would help people feel a little better about the security of it all and pot potentially prevent people from stealing NFTs from your non-custodial wallet by adding extra protections and things like that into place. Um, we obviously have a lot of issues right now with th thievery and uh, stolen NFTs, people getting scammed. Uh, and so obviously, we need to improve uh, drastically in those areas for normal people to feel like they can come and spend their hard-earned money speculating on pictures of cats and 
apes and stuff. So I think you know there's a lot of uh, user onboarding that needs to happen and uh, creating like experiences, tools, custodial wallets, and things like that. Those, these are hard problems to solve. It's not something individual projects can take on. Um, so I, I think really I would encourage any builders out there to like dive deeper into like the technology and figure out what new innovative things you can do. Unfortunately, innovation is not often rewarded with market like change and price and stuff. It's more like meme economy almost. But I think that the innovations matter and even if people don't acknowledge it at the time, you might someone might see your project or what you did and be inspired and create the next board apes or something else and at least like you helped move that along even if you didn't realize it. So just like you know, do something you feel like matters. If you see something like I saw with like on-chainness missing from the whole, like what I thought was missing from the ecosystem, I created on-chain NFTs after I saw the example that uh, Larva Labs created, uh, you know, and then I created a digital asset ownership license for those as well, so it was commercial rights. This was before Yuga Labs did their commercial rights. Um, and I don't know if they saw that license or not, um, but you know, they came out with their project a, a year and a half later that has the commercial rights. Um, and so maybe they saw that and did it, I don't know. But uh, I'm glad I did the things I did and I'm glad I put the innovations I did into Avastars um, because it set hopefully an example for some future builders and some people have created some things since. That's awesome. And there's, a, there's so many different things that can be solved for the builders out there. The user journey is awful right now. <laughs> it's it's better. It's better than it was, but it is still it has a lot to be to be had in mobile, right? Try to buy something on a website that asks you to launch your MetaMask wallet on an Android device today. Yeah, no, it's not happening. So that's that's I think a, a really good core message. So we're here in the space. We've got your wallet circulating on the TVs. By the way, those those are definitely not my apes and. Um, there are a number of folks who are also trying to break into the space or trying to figure out how to really do well. Do you have any advice for creators, artists in particular, maybe not PFP artists, but actually, you know, th they have great works of art that they want to make into NFTs that they can really get, get more reach, right? get out into the community and do those things. Do you have any advice for those folks? Um, if you're an existing creator and you already have a fan base, I would start there, engage interest there, and see you know what they think. And if you can get some really loyal folks who have uh, have some conviction to purchase your digital art and as the form of NFTs, um, I would encourage uh, any any creators uh, getting into the space to probably collect first or at least start to understand uh, what the space looks like and uh, what the successful artists are doing um, to succeed. I mean, it took them a long time. You know, you had X copy, for example, who's now like, you know, you, you, know, you can sell art artworks of his for a million dollars. But um, there was a time where in 2018 and 2019, where I could literally go to a website called Known Origin and he had an edition of 50, I think, of this skull. It's one of his first skulls that he did. And you could mint them at will. Like, I could go mint five and come back a week, late, week later and mint five more. Um, they were like 0.05 ETH. I think they sell for like 10 ETH or something now. But, I mean, he was putting his work out there. He was selling it for tens to hundreds of dollars. Um, and uh, it took like almost three years for his stuff to really take off. So, I wouldn't look for overnight success and overnight, like, market just exploding. It does happen on occasion. I, I don't think it's anything that uh, is easy to replicate. Um, it certainly can be done, but you have to like create a viral moment basically and get the community to base all the community to be talking about it in order for that to happen. So I would just grind really like, you know, set out, set your objectives, you know, get those small wins and build on that, figure out what the community likes, doesn't like, figure out what's working. Um, if you're in the space for a few months and you're following enough accounts in the NFT Twitter sphere, uh, you can start to get a feel for the meta and potentially sentiment and like what's working. And if you can move fast, you can potentially take advantage of those uh, swings in the market and those different meta moments. Uh, but I would say really like even if you don't buy NFTs of your the artists and stuff, find those other creators that you really respect and get into their communities and see what they're doing right and what you feel like you could do better. And if you're a collector trying to get into this space, uh, I kind of have the same advice as to, except for you're obviously gonna eventually buy some NFTs 
find that artist or project that you really connect with that you would uh, feel comfortable having in your wallet forever and willing to your kids, like I did with CryptoKitties, um, and you know, buy things that bring you joy or invoke an emotion that you want to feel. Start there. Don't try to speculate just to like make money in the space. Like none of us, like in 2018 and 19, like we literally were just throwing money at the blockchain and never with no expectation of really making money. Unless the the thought then was that like if NFTs take off, everybody's gonna want a Crypto Kitty because it was the first project and it wasn't the first project. It was the first ERC 721. Um, but that prediction by all of the community that was breeding Crypto Kitties did not end up being correct. Um, in any way, shape, or form. Doesn't mean CryptoKitties won't have its day in the sun again. Um, if we do all of a sudden get a billion people in the space, uh, I don't know that we have a billion NFTs in existence yet. Maybe we do, but you know, maybe people want to buy CryptoKitties. Uh, but yeah, I would just say like, do your research. Obviously, uh, Gary V does a good job of saying you know do 50 hours before you buy anything. Um, I think that's good advice. Uh, Crypto or NFT Twitter can be a little bit daunting and full of memes and sarcasm and everything else, but spending your 50 hours in there, uh, you know, you could start to decipher what people are actually trying to say and, you know, what matters. So, yeah, just take your time. I mean, there's always, there's going to be another opportunity probably like Bored Apes. There may not be, but um, if you're there and ready for it and you have ETH at that moment, that's the key. Like, if I didn't have liquid ETH at the time, if I had degen into some other NFTs the day before, uh, I wouldn't have been able to mint all of those bored apes. Um, so you want to always keep some firepower on hand, especially right now. Like right now we're in a down market. Um, everything's depressed. The price of crypto is depressed. The prices of NFTs are depressed. So it's like a doubling effect where the, the USD value of some of these crypto uh, NFTs is like a quarter of what they were. Um, but it's also buying season right now if you're brave because you follow the opposite of what sentiment is in these like buy, buy when uh, people are selling and you sell when people are buying. I sell on the way up, I hold my shit on the way down and try to have enough liquid ETH to buy things uh, when I can. So I've been doing, I don't have a lot of liquid ETH right now. Luckily I spent most of it um, on taxes and shit like that uh, right before crypto crashed. So I'm like illiquid into NFTs. Um, which to me is actually not a bad place to be, given that I, I do have a little bit of cash, uh, because it gives me the opportunity to benefit, um, like if someone decides that a board ape, for example, is actually worth $400,000 tomorrow instead of $200,000, uh, then I could potentially double up my ETH um, through that sale, rather than if I had just held the ETH independently. That's not a great example, that's not gonna happen, but the point is is that, for me, where I found success and why I was able to buy board apes and things like that is I, I bought uh, a bunch of those autoglyphs that I mentioned earlier. I ended up buying 30 of them. I minted 18, I bought another 12. I was paying two ETH for them straight up right after they were minted and they were minted for 0.2 and my friends thought I was crazy and they sold them to me all day long. A couple of them traded me some crypto kitties for their auto. I, they wanted my crypto kitties, I traded them my glyphs. Uh, my buddy Nate Alex, if you guys know him, you can ask him about that. Um, I spent on average about $300 on those uh, autoglyphs and the most I paid for one was 5 ETH um, but the average I paid for them was probably about 1.5 ETH and uh, right before like Bored Apes and all that launched uh, the average, I think the floor price on autoglyphs was somewhere around 150 ETH. So, and, and I want to point out that I bought these for like 1.5 ETH when ETH was around $200. So I paid three to $400 a piece and was able to sell them for hundreds of thousands of dollars a piece. And that's what put me in a position to be able to you know, buy Bored Apes. Um, I held on to those things for a long time. A lot of my friends sold out a lot sooner. Uh, they were selling for 10, before they were 150 ETH, they went from two ETH to five ETH to 10 ETH to 15 ETH. And most people reach a point where they're like, I have to take this money. Um, I was just, you know, I have like this, Part of it's laziness sometimes, like I don't want to like sit down and sell the stuff, but part of it too is that, you know, I learned pretty early not to sell all of my, if I have a collection of NFTs, don't ever sell all of them. You might lose, but like don't ever sell all of them. You always want to hold on to at least a few if you can, um, just in case that market does something you didn't anticipate in a good way. Um, and you know, of course, after you've made your money and you're comfortable and everything else, so never speculate with money that you don't have. But um, yeah, I kind of lost track of what the question was there. I think it was good. My takeaway, my takeaway was get smart. Yeah.
Get smart, don't sell. Yeah. I've done one of those. Well, you got to sell eventually. But. All right. The, the last question that I have, because I know there are some questions out there, but I'm going to preempt literally everyone and ask this one. What projects are you watching right now, Jim? Uh, well, uh, I really have an affinity for cyber brokers. Um, my friend Josie Bellini created that project. Uh, it's also entirely on-chain. Um, so I feel like it's a, uh, a successor to Avastars in a lot of ways. Um, and the art is just killer. I love it. I don't know what the floor price is on those right now, but I was scooping up a bunch around like two and a half and three ETH. And then uh, I bought a couple like, like expensive ones as well to, to really solidify my place in that community. Um, I, uh, my, a couple of friends of mine, I'm involved in a project called the Gota. Uh, it just launched uh, this week actually for the Mint Pass. Uh, that one's in conjunction with an uh, amazing artist named Nina Chanel Abney. Uh, Pharrell and uh, Cause, actually. Uh, I'm really excited about Cause coming into the space. Uh, he's a cool pop artist, uh, has had a lot of impact on, on culture in general. And uh, I think that when my friends and I used to talk about artists coming into the space and who would we want it to be back in like 2019 and stuff, it was like Banksy and Cause were the two that, that we wanted. So I'm really excited about that project, uh, thegoda.io. So that's me shilling something that I'm involved in. Um, something I'm not involved in, but I really like, is uh, the Tom Sachs Rocket Factory. So Tom Sachs is like this traditional artist who's done a bunch of collaborations uh, with people like Nike. I'm actually wearing his Nike shoes right now. Um, and he made this cool project last year where you like minted rocket parts and then you could assemble the rocket. And then once you assembled the rocket, you could go and schedule it for a real physical model rocket to be in the exact likeness of your NFT to be launched by Tom Sachs and his team. You can go and participate in the launch. And then the rocket itself, you can claim and keep the physical. You can donate it to this uh, wall he's creating that's going in a museum. Or you can shred it. Uh, they don't, they're not really sure why people are shredding them, but they gave them the option. And so they have like a shredder in the studio where you can actually shred them. Um, the reason I like this project is because uh, it uses something called composability, and that's taking two NFTs, two or more NFTs, and mashing them together and creating something new, like CryptoKitties. Um, in this case, you had to assemble the rocket. Uh, there was three different parts. You could put stickers on them and things like that. But then, once you have the rocket and you launched your rocket, you could go claim a ticket with your rocket, and that ticket puts your rocket on this huge, like, Mars spaceship that was going to Mars to mine rocks. So I put like three of my, spaceship, my spaceships on this thing. I went to mine some rocks on Mars virtually. Um, Tom Sachs actually set up something in Decentraland to go mine your rocks. Um, and then now we got our rocks. So we got rock. our rocks. I have one rock. Yeah. And now apparently these rocks will turn into something. You can create something out of the rocks as well. But it's a, like, there's not really any good games out there yet right now with NFTs. So playing with NFTs really takes the form of doing like blockchain transactions and like uh, maybe a little bit of game theory and stuff like that. But it's, it's really just making more NFTs out of NFTs. Um, but I really like that project because there's not many projects right now that are trying to do these innovative things. Another one, I got to give a shout out to Frankie Supducks. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a project that he's just continued to build on and add more and more and more things to it. Um, and I really like the way he's experimenting with different ideas. And Frankie worked with us for a little while um, at NFT42, but we had to let him fly. Um, he has so many amazing ideas uh, for NFTs and new cool things to do with NFTs. I can't wait to see what he comes up with in the future. Yeah, I've been taking as much of Frankie's stuff that I can get my hands on. Frankie's been doing an excellent Plus job. Plus, he's just an awesome dude. Yeah, Frankie's awesome. Yeah. All right, questions. All right. I can do this one. All right, so if three board apes and a mutinate got together to form a band, what would happen? Kingship, yeah. <laughs> but, so I wanted to get that plug in there. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. And S uh, Celine appreciates that, too. I did forget about Kingship. Uh, so real quick, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, I did sign a deal with uh, Universal Music Group last year uh, for four of my, three of my apes and one of my mutants to form a band called Kingship. Um, we're actually, we delayed the NFT launch, the community launch for that, because it was like we were launching right when all this stuff happened uh, about a month ago. 
And uh, we're actually ramping up and getting ready to launch our, uh, our NFT project here soon. Everybody's curious about the music. Uh, I am too. She hasn't told me much, but I know it's being worked on. I do know of all these other cool things that like the community's doing. We talked a little about access and utility and everything else. And um, I'm really impressed with what Kingship has in store for its uh, NFT holders. Cool. Thanks, man. My pleasure. So my question is, so success leaves clues, okay? So we look for, you know, follow someone's success. We look for clues we can find them. A lot of times, you've already shared many of them, which are things that people did right. Uh, but what are some of the mistakes you made, the oof moments, the oh shit moments, that us as either artists or creators may learn from those mistakes so that we maybe don't make as many? We're still going to make plenty, but maybe not as many. Okay. Uh, that's a really good question, actually. Um, I talked about earlier how I like I'm really proud of all the stuff I did on the Avastars project. There was actually a ton of innovation um, because it was like a couple years worth of my ideas built up, and I was trying to express it all in one project. Um, but we did too much. Uh, we we did on chain. We did uh, too much all at once. We did too many new things. We introduced too many new ideas. Like you need to stick to like really simple concepts that people can grasp onto really easily. Like if you see Bored Apes, ten thousand PFP, commercial rights. We had commercial rights, but we were talking about how our NFTs were stored on chain. We were talking about how they're commercial rights. We were talking about how you were going to be able to make replicants because you can actually breed these things as well. We were talking about all of these, the, the scrolling mechanism, the way that we did discovery of avastars. It was, you actually got to pick out your avastars, everyone's hand picked. We talked about all these things, um, but it was too much. And uh, it was a tough concept. Like, where do, which concept do you grasp onto? Which part do you care about? How does someone else start to explain this when we're the ones sending out the messaging, explaining like 17 things at once instead of just, you know, hey, you know, it's an on-chain NFT and you get commercial rights or something, you know? So, uh, like, yes, innovate, but do it in a way that's digestible to your community. Kill your darling. Yes. That, that was really it. Just kill your darlings. Yeah, it's, yeah. that's why like cover songs work so well, too, is because it's something familiar already. People know, and then there's a twist. And then a lot of covers are more successful than the original. So yep, I one. totally... But yeah, yeah. So it was destroy your darlings? Is that what it... Kill, kill your, your darlings. Kill, kill your, your darlings. darlings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I can identify with that a lot. That's ex yeah. essentially what I was trying to say. That's a good analogy, yeah. I mean, you know, be authentic, you know, make something that you actually want yourself. I mean, I, I wanted these things. I minted a thousand of them myself, spent my own money to do that um, because I, they're, it, to me, it still is one of the best projects out there and I believe in it and I have conviction for it. So if it's not something that you would do yourself or be interested in yourself or if you wouldn't be a collector of it, if you don't fucking love it, don't do it, right? So just, you know. It, that way, at least, like, if you're doing something you care about, like, you'll have some sense of satisfaction when it's all over, even if no one else cared about it. Not seeing any other hands up. I thought you had one. I thought you had one in the back pocket there. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take any. So, what's um, a thing that you remember? You told us some stuff, but like. I love that you were talking about having an emotional response to something or following something. Don't just buy something a aping into it. But um, what are some like concepts that you remember having? Like you gave us some, but like I don't know, like emo like an emotional response. I think the it. emotional response for me has more come from art and not like PFPs or anything like that. Before I was collecting, there there wasn't like a huge PFP push until like you know right before Board Apes really. Um, so a lot of what I did in uh, 20, late 2019 and through 2020 was collect art on super rare, known origin, maker's place. Um, by the way, if you're a creator and an artist, to answer Matt's earlier question a little further, if you can get on one of these established platforms, um, even if it's not on Ethereum, Tezos has like some stuff now. I don't know if Solana is really a blockchain, but... Um, <laughs> Cosmos, baby. Uh, I, I, found some, I found some artists that uh, I really connected with and got to know them, like through purchasing their art and then having conversations with them. And uh, one, the more that I learned about some of these artists, one in particular is Giant Swan. He's an artist out of uh, Melbourne, Australia. He paints in uh, a vert, he paint, he 
paints with motion in virtual reality, basically. And he creates 3D uh, paintings uh, that you can experience. Some of them you can experience in virtual reality. I think eventually you'll be able to experience them all. But the more you get to know, the more I got to know uh, Giant Swan, uh, the more I realized how much of his emotion was tied into the work and that he was pouring his soul into this work. And starting to understand that and him as an individual and seeing that like, just made me connect with the art on such a deeper level. Um, the, the simple answer I can give is that like, I like shiny things. So like, when I see like, bright, shiny objects, I kind of want to have them. And so like, a lot of my collection is very bright and poppy and uh, colorful. Uh, it's just things that make me happy and make me smile that I want to hang on my walls. Uh, that's like the best way to collect. It's even better if it's not expensive and they're not like a established artist that, you know, so support upcoming artists and, you know, not all of them are going to be a, a Hackatow or an X copy, but you might make some friends along the way too. And um, so if we're talking about utility NFTs and we know kind of the far future of like that potential, or we don't know, but like there's all these utility tokens. What, what do you think about the value, like be, the art being the utility? Do you think that that um, long term will be enough because it's a store of value for wealthy people? And so instead of collecting physical art, they'll be collecting um, art, fine art um, in, in light of the market conditions and what DGENs consider art nowadays, you know, or like blue chip, blue chip NFTs, <laughs> blue chip NFTs versus actual like fine art, you know. Well, I think you're always going to have um, more liquidity with uh, like PFP collections than you will with art. Um, when you're dealing um, with any high-end market, what I, what I have learned over the last couple of years, because I had no idea about any of this before, is um, you, know, you can get buyers for these expensive you know, thousand ETH for an X copy or something like that, but you have to do work to find that usually. You could list it on the market and hope for a sale, um, but the higher-end sales are typically going to take longer and be farther and fewer between. Um, so if it's just about like, you know, where that easier, where it's going to be easier to sell your NFTs in the future, I would definitely say like projects that have a strong community, big communities, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, liquidity and churn in the market is obviously going to be a better like play for that sort of thing. But, um, I, you know, I, I don't really know uh, what any of these things are going to be worth in five or 10 years. Some of them could be worth nothing. Some of them could be absolutely priceless. Um, and uh, I think the most expensive NFTs could end up being, you know, one of one art from established artists and things like that, uh, rather than just like a PFP or something. Although the thing about the PFPs is like the community aspect and the collected, like the same thing that happened with GameStop, where like people just decided GameStop was going to be valuable and fuck the traditional investors. like. They can do that, they, you can do that with any project these days. Like goblins, to a certain extent, like demonstrated that recently. But I think Bored Apes demonstrated that before and like Cool Cats and all of these projects are like tapping into this same mechanism. Um, a lot of these markets right now are based on our imagination and what we believe these things could be in the future. Um, and uh, unfortunately, most of the time, um, imagination does not meet reality and the reality is not as cool as what you were thinking. Um, I think NFTs in general like exceed expectations there, but most projects don't. Um, so, uh, I, I, I mean, it's hard to say like if our imagination is going to catch up. Like, I, I am a little bit worried that we have tied too much value to our collective imagination here instead of the realities of what's being created, and uh, we're assigning value more value to popularity than we are innovation, which I mentioned earlier. I think that's a dangerous and slippery slope. I've tried to mix my collecting with like projects I support either because they're my friends or they're innovating mixed with like popularity. Like Cyber Brokers is a good example. It hasn't taken off like Goblin Town or any of those things, but it's excellent art. It's got excellent technology and it has that community and there is liquidity in the market. So if I absolutely had to sell some, I could even if it was for a loss since we're down a little bit. But yeah, it's hard to predict those things, right? As long as you have a Mars rock, though, you're set. Thank you. Thank you. you can give the mic away now. Hi. Uh, what do you think of the PFP trend right now? And do you think that they're going to be all interested in entering the metaverse? 
Uh, I think that uh, we probably need a lot more PFPs, unfortunately. Uh, but I do hope that we take a short break from that until we onboard more users. Uh, as far as entering the metaverse, I hope that many projects are planning on doing something inside of the virtual space eventually. Uh, with Avastars, we're actually, right now, we've contracted a company called Crypto Avatars, uh, a guy named Tok Sam who's been in the space all, probably longer than I have, I don't know. Uh, he is making 3D models for all of our existing Avastars. Um, and you'll be able to claim those sometime optimistically in August. Um, and those will actually be uh, multi fi multiple file types, anywhere from voxelized files to VRM files to whatever the hell they use in Decentraland. Um, you'll basically be able to use Avastars in these virtual spaces um, eventually. And I do think a lot of projects that are still around as we see uh, an emergent space to hang out in, because we're still like pretty nascent on places that hang out virtually. Maybe it's going to be other deeds or something like that. I do think we'll see more and more projects do that in order to continue to keep the community satiated, keep their attention. Uh, Frankie Nines, who I mentioned earlier, he just did uh, VX ducks, which are like 3D voxelized sup ducks. Um, they look really good. Yeah. So I, I do think that a fair amount of those projects will make a transition into the metaverse, just because that's where the attention is going to go. Um, I don't know how soon we're going to see that. Like I said, other other side might be a good uh, a good one for us. Um, you know, I don't even play Fortnite anymore, but I saw their uh, trailer for s their new season today, and I just can't help but think. But that's like where we're eventually going to be hanging out with these things. You know, I know Tim Sweeney's still anti NFTs. I've actually jabbed him a few times on Twitter for some of his stupid comments, but. Um, I think he's going to come around eventually because this is the future. Gamers, for some reason, are anti-NFTs predominantly right now. I'm a gamer. That's how I got into NFTs. Uh, I, you know, maybe these guys have never bought skins in a game or something like that. But you know, sometimes you get valuable ones and you want to sell them. And sometimes you have too many valuable ones to, you know, what am I going to do? I'm going to buy more video games with the money. You know, so it's it's cool. Like that was the early you know early indication to me that like. You know, the virtual goods are actually valuable is when I was playing Dota 2 and I'm selling skins for like $100, $200, $300. Um, that, that was an eye-opening time for me in like 2015, 16 time frame. Awesome. All right, everybody. That was Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you all. <laughs>